Good evening and welcome. Um, it's six o'clock and I'm now going to hand over to Dr. Akhtar Hussain. Thank you. Good evening, colleagues. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to join the South African Medical Association and SADEX Healthcare Workers Care Network for a special webinar that will address a topics of utmost importance, the mental health of medical professional. In a world that is constantly evolving, our approach to healthcare must evolve as well. The significance of mental health has never been clearer than it is today. The doctors often refer to the healers of the society, play a pivotal role in our lives. You shoulder the responsibility of caring for our physical health, but you too face your own set of challenges. The demanding nature of your work, long hours, emotional strain can take a toll on your mental well being. As we gather here today, we aim to shed light on this often overlooked aspect. We can collectively create an environment that nurtures our mental health. Throughout the course of this webinar, we will be privileged to hear from. Neil Amor, a clinical psychologist who has been practiced for 25 years, and Crazy Chamber, operational director at SADEP. This mental health expert will share their insight, experience, and research finding as they discuss the importance of the mental health awareness and strategy to cope with the stress and burnout and ways to foster resilience and emotional well-being among the doctors. Nell, over to you. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. And uh, thank you for taking time out here to join me. I, I apologize. I think we're going to have this discussion on Tuesday. Um, and I, I Unfortunately, my wife had to go through a minor procedure and I felt my own mental health was dependent on, upon me uh, being there for her. So I, I, I thank you for indulging me uh, for not actually uh, having, having been there on Tuesday. But I hope tonight is going to be an informative talk. I hope it's something that you're going to gain uh, something from. I hope you're going to get a sense of understanding of, of how we need to care for ourselves in, in this field. Um, right off the bat, I'm going to apologize. It's going to look like I'm not looking at you. There's looking into the camera of these, that when we do these kind of discussions is a bit weird and alienating. So um, just be aware that I'm, I'm, still, I'm still here and I'm present and, and listening to you. Tonight's talk is, is something that grew out of a, a discussion that we had at the, uh, the Glenview Hospital around preparing for our symposium, our annual symposium, and being asked to present on, on mental health in general. What I became acutely aware of is that we, we tend to have an understanding of the mental health challenges faced by our patients, but we, we overlook the, the impact of the mental health challenges that we face in, in the healthcare professions and how we cope with that. And so in the preparing of a discussion around that in the talk, I became acutely aware of the, the difficulties experienced by colleagues in, in various professions, various specialities. And it's inescapable that I'm gonna draw on the experience that we had collectively um, of COVID. Tonight is not a talk specifically about COVID, but it's impossible, I think, to move away from the framework and how that really highlighted the, the challenges that we face, how we each had to cope um, both collectively and, and then obviously individually, how being in private practice was in some ways quite a different experience to working in, in a hospital setting or a team setting. And I think to a significant degree, from a mental health perspective, we're still suffering from the hangover of that, that the, the, the challenges that we face, the ones that we still face now, the, the, the sort of the, the dropping away of the, the hero's cape, as it were, that was merely given to everybody in, in healthcare at the time, has been something we've had to, to significantly adjust to. Um, I want to just start with, with getting an understanding of, of how 
we deal with this. And, and the, the phrase for me um, is, is how do we heal ourselves? You know, that one of the cons- kind of concerns here is that we have this kind of statement that healer heal ourselves, but healing ourselves does not mean treating ourselves. Um, we have to come to an understanding of how we can start to open up and share and do that in a non-judgmental way and start to feel that we can get the necessary care and concern that we, we need both from our colleagues and from folk um, in, in, a, in a network such as uh, Cassie is going to sort of uh, highlight from, from a, a, a SADAC point of view. Um, so we can start with this heal to heal ourselves. And one of the things that um, I'd like us to focus on tonight as well is how do we start to identify the resources within ourselves and within our immediate environment? And why don't we start with the fact that I, I walk through corridors and at hospitals and I often hear doctors chatting to each other and I, I speak to them. And, and one of the things that doctors seem to be particularly good at doing is, um, is, is treating each other and not necessarily going and formally going and seeing a doctor for themselves when they fall ill and tend to deviate from this norm um, and don't necessarily use the care sort of pathways as much as they possibly could and should in this context. Um, and so how do we get folk in, in this frame to start to identify when they need to do that? And what we know is that mental health and mental illness doesn't care about our professions. It doesn't care about our background. It doesn't care about our status. It doesn't care about our practices. Um, we still have to function every single day. We have to put on a smile. We have to put on a professional facade. We have to cope. We have to bury. We have to compartmentalize. We have to deal with these things and yet pitch up every day and be professional. But at the same time, we're human. And we suffer the same kinds of stigma. We suffer a second layer of stigma, in fact, in that we suffer stigma very often from our own colleagues when it, when it comes to this. Um, and one of the, the images that we were left with <clears throat> during COVID very strongly was this one where suddenly, you know, doctors and healthcare professionals, nurses and everybody else were, were seen as, as superheroes. And part of the inspiration for this talk came from a moment during, during that first wave in COVID, um, the mental health uh, our staff at, at Glenview Psychiatric Hospital here in Benoni were asked by a neighboring hospital, um, General Hospital, to provide a team of volunteers to help in the liaison between ICU and and the families of patients that were in the ICUs. And so a group of us volunteered and so we were just involved in that. And I'll never forget the first day that I arrived, we'd been told that we had to, been given strict instructions that we had to wear every known PPE, um, everything known to man. When I arrived and I donned it all because I'd been instructed to do so and I looked like a blue smurf, I could barely move. Um, whereas all the staff around me had a, had a much more battle, worn, battle weary approach and we're just trying to get on with things. But I remember walking out of ICU one day, uh, somewhere in so sort of that middle 2020, and I, I saw one of the specialists who was crying, um, was enormously emotional, and just kept saying, I can't do this. This has to stop. This has to stop. This has to stop. And bear in mind, this was the first wave. And I remember going up to her and going, you know, can I help? Can I, this is what I'm here for. Can we chat? And was suddenly sort of writing herself and putting on her, her mask again and of coping and going, no, 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 I'm fine, I'm okay. And it struck me the pressure that doctors were facing at a very different level. But also what struck me was how there was a need to immediately write herself and correct herself and to carry on. I remember too, during that time, going to various doctors' practices for whatever reason, and just, and just speaking to, to doctors generally and just seeing a look on their faces that reminded me, as I have, have, having spent a fair amount of time in the military with a particular interest around combat PTSD, the military structures, of the faces of, of medics in war zones, the, the strain and the stress that they were facing, the drawn looks, the sense of exhaustion, but that desperate need to carry on, the, the demand for them to carry on. And I remember thinking, what is the impact of this going to be once this pandemic has settled down. Where are healthcare workers going to be when that happens? When food market, you know, supermarkets and, and food stores were, were kind of offering that if you were wearing scrubs or you could prove that you were a healthcare worker, that you'd get to the front of the line, that you would be served first, um, only to find that people were then also being ostracized because they were wearing scrubs or because they were effectively being seen as carriers of some sort of disease, were being shunned. And I'm sure you'll all remember that during that time, there was this healthcare workers, the heroes, and having spent 
time in the military, as I said, I, I was very keenly aware that, that soldiers in wartime are very popular. Soldiers in peacetime have no, have no place. And saying to colleagues, when this is over, this is not going to be something that lasts. This is not going to be a new normal. This is very likely to be something where people go back to moaning about appointments, moaning about accounts, moaning about scripts, moaning about lack of treatment, lack of care, lack of concern. Everything that's done now is not going to be something that lasts. And I, I would hope that that's, that is not true. I hope that's just a cynicism on my part, but I'm pretty confident that that is not the case. And that we've had to make that significant adjustment back to being service providers instead of being superheroes in this context. How do, we, how do we deal with the stigma? Well, we have to understand what stigma is. Firstly, stigma is obviously a negative perception that somebody has of who we are and what we're dealing with, okay? And this is particularly true with somebody with mental illness. You know, if you look at particular conditions, we, in many conditions, we would term somebody who is ill, we would call them a patient, we, we, we treat them as such. But with some conditions, we refer to them by their diagnosis. We are referring to somebody who is an addict. We're referring to somebody who is depressed, somebody who is bipolar. And so stigma carries a particular weight. And so we define that individual very often by the illness rather than who they are as a person. Now, stigma is obviously also socially constructed. It's media, social media, uh, various organizations drive this, reinforce this. We have, you know, um, television, we have movies. Uh, we don't often find, you know, media portraying people with mental illness very well or very accurately. Um, they tend to be regarded as the, the dangerous one. They tend to be regarded as the one who's particularly um, imbalanced. And, 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 you know, there's not a tremendously sort of clear and, and sort of compassionate understanding of the person with a health mental health care problem is. But I would also challenge you to find a portrayal or depiction of a healthcare worker with mental health issues um, that is both compassionate and challenging within the mainstream media. We, we don't, I'll, I'll touch on a program just now called Dope Sick, where one of the protagonists is a, a fictional doctor um, who has an addiction problem with an opioid and not portrayed necessarily in the, in the gentlest, or the nicest of life. There's not often a lot of sympathy <laughs> For, for healthcare workers in that sense. So we have this misperception very often that goes with us. And how do we start to challenge that? How do we deal with that? Particularly difficult uh, when we have this need to portray ourselves as strong and capable and knowledgeable at all times, where you have to, I would liken it to being a sort of a radio presenter in the morning. You don't care what that person has gone through. When you get up to drive into the traffic, you expect them to be on their top form and just be able to entertain you and to deal with things. And for, a, for a healthcare worker, that's particularly challenging when you've got your own issues going on. We now find, too, that obviously the risk with discrimination that comes from the stigma is that we then start self-destructive behaviors. The person feels so alienated and so isolated that they start to act out in a way that then is that is that is internalized distress, and they start to self-destruct in that context, which only confirms the, the stigma that people have of the person, that you are, in fact, this person that can't be trusted. When you have a particular status in society, such as a healthcare worker, you suffer reputational damage. You suffer all the concerns that go with that. There are the three basic forms of stigma that we're going to look at. And if anybody wants the references at the end of this, please just let me know. I'm happy to email them to you. The first one that we'd be concerned with is going to be the public stigma, which is how we are seen in a public sphere. These are negative or discriminatory attitudes that those the other folk have about mental illness, about ourselves and who we are. And within mental health and within the medical profession, I mean, this is not we're immune to it. We very often actually buy into that and use the same sort of language. You know, a significant portion of patients actually feel quite stigmatized by their mental health care professional. They, they feel that the language that is used is harsh and abrasive and pretty stigmatizing, and we're not necessarily aware that we're using it. Things like, you know, he's, these are discussions between colleagues, you know, like, oh, he's so schizo, he's a schizo, or she's such a borderline, or I can't understand that she's so controlled, or what are these, you know, they can't, they can't manage themselves. And the problem with this is that this adds to the weight of, of emotional stress that we feel because it prevents us feeling um, that we can in fact come out and speak about the concerns that we have. We might be struggling with something quite similar, but we start to feel that we're not going to be able to speak to a very sympathetic audience. The folk that we feel that should be able to treat us have an understanding that we have as well are in fact somehow stigmatizing these people as well. And we, we, we buy into that very strongly. The second is self stigma These are obviously the internalized sense of shame that this is the inner shame that I'm somehow weak, that I don't have um, some, you know, I don't have the, the internal resource, I don't have the structure, the capacity to deal with any of the stuff that if I'm, I'm depressed, I must be weak. 
Now that flies in the face of the knowledge that we have, this flies in the face of the evidence, but that personal experience triumphs over that in many, many cases. And that how am I able to do this job? With all my training, how can I do this job if I in fact have this internal conflict and the strife and the struggle? Moving away from it, moving to a broader level, and I have institutional stigma, and this is where our employers, our regulatory bodies, um, associations at a much broader level will in fact start with pressure on us to, to cope, to portray ourselves as strong and capable. I remember getting an email um, at the start of the pandemic from the Health Professionals Council speaking specifically to psychologists. I don't know if anybody else got this. Um, and in it, we were encouraged to be, quote unquote, the heroes of our community. I was struck by that. I thought, you know, what I'm trying to do right now is trying to regulate and manage how we cope with with dealing with online consultations. How are we going to deal with this? I was worried about my own family concern. I was struggling to do all of that. And then I'm being told I have to be a hero to my community at a time when I, I didn't know how to be a hero to my own family. And that is particularly challenging. We then look at how do we respond to these demands from without, where we are put in a position where presenteeism is more of a concern in our field than it might be, than might be absenteeism. We were expected to be at work every single day, no matter what. The guilt that comes with letting down patients with not being able to perform to, at, our, at our best to, to optimal level, and what that says about us is a weight that is very difficult to carry. I would quote William Shakespeare here, and he said that uneasy lies the head that wears the crown that the weight of responsibility that healthcare professionals carry, that when you go to bed at night thinking of where you made mistakes, we didn't do things well, if you're now having to acknowledge that taking a day off is in your best interest, that'd be extremely hard to cope with and swallow when you have this weight of the stigmatization that goes with that. What we're now looking at effectively is what are our barriers to treatment? Because we're looking at how do we get to this? How do we get to a point where we can actually reach out and ask for help? One of our concerns, one of the biggest ones, is, is the sense of vulnerability that we would, that would come about by feeling that we're exposing ourselves to peer criticism, that you can't cope. There's this need to be able to cope in a team, this need to be able to cope in comparison to colleagues, that we walk away from conversations with colleagues who might open up, and we either walk away sort of feeling that, well, that was great, this person opened up, and I, I wish I'd be glad I'm not them, or just the sense that I don't know if I'm willing to actually find myself being judged that we, we're worried about fear of professional censure. You know, how do, we, how do we deal with the fact that if I do acknowledge this, am I in fact going to be, am I gonna have my, my regulated body come down on me? Am I going to be reported? Is something going to happen? In which case I'm going to in fact be, you know, declared impaired um, to someone like the Health Professions Council. That we, we have a mistrust of mental health care professionals or colleagues, we go back to the fact that we we don't necessarily trust them if we don't feel that they're actually, you know, going to be sympathetic or compassionate enough. Do we feel that these are people that can go to and a significant portion, a significant portion of psychiatrists in America, for example, started off by speaking to family and strangers before they spoke to colleagues. They in fact have activities that required that require them to not say a word because of concern about sharing their, their emotions and their, their vulnerabilities with colleagues. This pressure that we have to cope and to be a competent, to be a competent at all times. That the fact is our training immunizes us, often desensitizes us. Yes, we're armed with, with a tremendous sort of skill base and a knowledge base, and, and we're able to cope in these environments, but we often find that that actually makes us feel that we don't have the right then to experience the things that a normal human being would experience, that we're not allowed to experience something that's traumatic, that we're not able to. to feel this tremendous weight and this impact because we're trained to do that. And we, we often ignore the fact that what our training allows us to do is to go into areas of great distress, great difficulty, and to stay there for slightly longer and cope for slightly longer, but it doesn't diminish the impact that that has on who we are and what we are. At the end of the day, we still leave and go home as people to our families. That we have the issue of confidentiality. Is what I'm sharing going to be kept between, between us? Am I going to be able to just share as, as I need to and feel that you're not going to go and tell other people about what I'm, what I'm speaking to you about. That, that brings into, the, into this the risk of reputational damage. Am I going to be seen as being sort of un, imbalanced, unable to cope with these things? The, the other thing that's interesting is sense of isolation. You see this a lot with folk in private practice is there isn't a team network to fall back on. There isn't a space to naturally debrief. I, I'm extremely fortunate that I work in a group practice and there are folk that I can speak to all the time. Um, 
But I, I saw and I've seen through time that folk in individual practice don't necessarily have that. So that can be particularly isolating. There's a, a greater pressure on those folk in many ways. And then obviously we've got personal factors, our personality, are we more drawn, are we more introverted, do we have um, sort of longer term issues that we're dealing with, and obviously our relationships, are there strong supportive relationships, and I have a structure that acts as a protective mechanism, are those present, and you know, when we did this talk at the GMPP, the Glenview Symposium, a few months ago, um, what was fascinating was that folk opened up, GPs, specialists, uh, from various professions, opened up, pointed out this difficulty, is that they found it very difficult to actually separate what they were dealing with at home from what was happening at work. That they would get to work and find what is often referred to as the heart sink patient on their list um, and would have to manage their day around that, but carrying a very strong personal load. And what was fascinating about the discussion was that as somebody opened up, so more and more people did, and everybody would look around them and go, am I going to be judged by this? And it was a tremendous sense of vulnerability for a period of time until everybody felt safe enough to do that. And then the floodgates opened. Then people really started to share. So it spoke again about the value of being able to break down the barrier to this. It's not the easiest thing in the world because we don't often get things like symposia. We don't often get these moments. So Cassie from Sad Eggs and the Deal later in terms of the network that's available. But this is to highlight how we have to find a way to challenge these barriers. And what we're looking at primarily is the response to this very often is then going to be burnout. The practitioner experiences tremendous burnout. The ICD-11 defines this as a result of chronic workplace stress that has not been successfully managed. And when you felt it, it's extremely difficult to not, to not be sensitive to it again. And there are three dimensions to this. The first is where I feel a tremendous sense of energy depletion or exhaustion. It becomes extraordinarily difficult to drag yourself up out of bed and get to work and find that you, you're able to cope with the full day, that you, you get used to doing that, but that overarching sense of exhaustion is one that builds up and starts to actually drain you. Um, and that then leads to the concern that we would have around, am I making good decisions? Am I able to do what I need to do? Am I able to function? We then also get sort of, a, sort of a mental distance. We start to become cynical. We start to become negative. We start to disengage. We start to become less than, than enthusiastic. We start to become cynical about what we're doing. Am I effective? Is this still something I want to do? Am I making a difference? And again, the fear that comes in there is that am I, am I making good decisions? Am I capable, as capable as I thought I was going to be? And that leads to the, the realities to become professionally possibly less efficacious, less efficient. Um, we start to struggle more. We start to, to bring less of ourselves into that. And the risk there is that we start to make mistakes that carry the risk of risk of legal or professional, professional censure. Um, but again, how do you reveal this to somebody without being seen as, as you know, you, am I worried about getting more referrals? Am I going to be able to cope? Will people still trust me? Is this a sign that I'm not actually cut out for this? And the worry then is we start to become quite resentful of the job that we do. We start to feel picked upon. We start to feel that we, you know, as a colleague said to me as recently as today, she said, I'm, I'm overworked, undervalued, underpaid, and underappreciated. And I have to see people for 12 hours a day. How do I do that when this is how I feel? I'm resentful towards them. I'm resentful to the patient that comes in, unloads on me for 15 to 20 minutes and then goes home to their life. I carry that and everybody else is damaged through the day and I have to carry them into tomorrow. And how do I, how do I cope with that? Well, I feel like there's a sense of utility around what I'm doing. And then, as we're saying, that what we, we worry about then is that that cynicism then travels home with us. It travels into other areas of our life. We start to look at the fact that my, my goals and who I want to be just start to shift too dramatically for me. The other thing is that when we look at how during from the pandemic in particular, that burnout rates amongst pretty much all specialities were significantly increased in South Africa, it was no different. Um, that was actually something that we saw the trends tended to follow here as well. One study showed that 50% of nurses here reported burnout, and that was after the start of COVID. That was just after the start of the pandemic. Um, and that did not improve. That did not improve because the demands and the drains didn't magically disappear. Two thirds of doctors in both rural and suburban experience burnout there. And yet that need to keep going, that need to continue anyway, despite a lack of resources emotionally and physically. 
because the demand was so great to keep that hero's cape on and to keep providing a service to your patients and dealing. And as much as this is aimed specifically, this talk was initially aimed specifically at mental health care professionals, it became very evident that GPs, doctors in, in private and government services who are dealing with patients on a day-to-day -day basis become, became mental health care professionals even more than they are generally on a daily basis. They should become the front line, not only from a medical perspective, but also from a mental health care perspective. So this is, this is equally valid um, for everybody in private and government practice. And then in the States, for example, this is the third on the list of the most burnt out medical professions behind your, medic, your emergency medicine and internal medicine practitioners. And I don't think that that would be terribly different in South Africa. The mental health um, impact and the, the, the tsunami that has followed um, this has followed the pandemic is still very, very clearly felt um, in our field. And again, South Africa is very closely linked to that. And of course, the demand for services increased. Um, especially for, for mental health care professionals and those folks, you know, even working in general medicine, having to match that mental health care um, burnout. Now, what we noticed is that a recent study again showed that there's such a shortage of psychiatrists in South Africa. There's a tremendous shortage. Um, and it's in, in a, no disrespect to any psychiatrists that are listening to that, it's an aging population, about 39% uh, of them are over the age of 50. Psychologists are not very different in some respects. Um, I happen to be one of the most youthful ones at about 105. Um, but it, it's a shortage, and psychologists are also, um, there's a shortage to them. So we cannot meet the mental health demands, both in private and in public sectors. And when I looked at the figures for, for, for medical practitioners, the numbers varied wildly, the ones that I could find. Um, but they all spoke of the, the same thing. There's a tremendous shortage. There's a huge demand. And those folks that are in the profession are having to work longer, um, A, because financially there's a need to. We have all sorts of pressures like NHI and all the things that are coming in. But there's a need to provide for longer. There's also a shortage. So there's a sense of emotional and moral responsibility and accountability to a patient base that means folks are starting to actually burn out but work for longer. And in the States, the burnout rate among psychologists from pre-COVID was significantly high. And we've seen that amongst our psychologists as well. Um, within mental health care frame, um, the allied health professionals um, suffered a, suffer a slightly unique challenge in that the length of involvement with them, with patients, is, 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 is problematic. There seems to be a lengthy period of time in which you walk a road with a patient. And then obviously the very detailed nature of the interventions at a social interactional level um, puts a particularly heavy, heavy burden on, on, on the allied health professions like social workers, occupational therapists, nurses, speech therapists, et cetera, et cetera. But for all of us, the exposure to the trauma that our patients have suffered creates a space where we have vicarious or secondary trauma that we can't escape. We can't escape leaving the office at the end of the day, carrying that burden of patients you've worked a long time with, you've walked a very long road with, where the outcome is not good um, or it's devastating. And to not feel a sense of personal responsibility or just at a human level to feel that burden. And again, we are trained to be dispassionate. We're trained to have, have a boundary. We're trained to have distance. And that's great. That's a strong framework, but we still leave carrying that burden. And we can't necessarily go home to families and share this with them, A, because of confidentiality, B, because we want to seem to be coping. But we also actually don't know how to translate that trauma very often to our families. How do you translate this to someone that doesn't share your world? And that becomes quite isolating. You now put that in a professional sphere where you're speaking to folk, and it might well be the case that I need to share the difficulty of this particular patient and what the case was, but I also need to show competence in terms of how I dealt with it. So am I able to fully share what it is I was backing with? Mm -hmm. Difficult in the mental health care space, and I, I think you'll find this in general practice uh, for medical practitioners too, is where you're dealing with folk who've got personality disorders, they've got uh, chronic and relapsing mood conditions or other medical conditions. Again, that becomes arduous. You have to stick that out and you have to deal with that on a daily basis. You've got to find the resources to cope with that and yet not feel cynical, disillusioned, or, or plain angry at times. Caseloads are huge. You know, we, we have to try and um, sort of manage you know, patients as best we can, but you're always kind of borrowing from Peter to pay Paul. And then there are financial demands to keep working. We, we're in a, in a very competitive space or challenges around medical aids, but the need to work for longer because we are concerned about our families and how we have to deal with that. And then obviously poor peer support, we don't necessarily have that kind of connection with folk. And then a big thing, our unhealthy coping mechanisms. Do we rely on substances? Do we have maladaptive patterns outside of work? And we rely on, have we got the healthiest coping mechanisms in place? We don't, those add to our burden and make it much harder for us to, to function. 
uh, depression and suicide. And, and here we'd want to talk about studies that looked at colloquial depression versus clinical depression and colloquial depression very often being regarded as kind of subclinical. And so that is something that, you know, at least 25%, you'll see it there, 25% or so of healthcare workers suffer from some sort of depression and anxiety. Probably about two thirds of those suffer from colloquial depression. Um, and this is often depression that, that, is, that is minimized. It's something that, that folk will sort of maybe touch on, but not go into detail about. We don't want to be seen as being um, weak and not coping, but it's something that we are very often miss the, the opportunity to intervene with and to treat. And again, you know, we, we tend to look at, this is something that we should be immune from because we have all the training, we have the understanding of how to deal with all of this. South African psychiatrists are two and a half times more likely to commit suicide than, than a regular population. And that could be quite a disturbing thought until you, you realize what a burden it is that they carry and what a burden it is that GPs carry and everybody in this field, that why would we be immune from this? We still suffer burnout. We still suffer trauma. Um, a psychologist in the States, you know, made up 5% of all healthcare worker suicides, which is amongst the highest of all of the, um, the, the, all of the professions in the U.S., and we, we still suffer all the PTSD. We, we, we still suffer at a far higher rate because we continue to go back into these areas. Um, the, the oft sort of quoted uh, sort of little mantra from in a military context is that while a civilian runs from the sound of the guns, the soldier runs towards them. And healthcare workers have to run towards the distress. They have to run towards us and have to be able to stay in that for longer. And that is what carries a toll. That is where we start to struggle and we don't, necessarily know how to cope with that, um, so much so that we see alarming rates of suicidality amongst healthcare workers. We also then get into the area where we get substance abuse. You know, this is often a, 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 a very well documented and unfortunately a, a very common um, form of, of, of coping amongst healthcare workers. Um, where the, the desperate need to keep going, the desperate need to carry on anyway, the, the fact that we don't know how to cope when we don't have um, the resources available to us is nonetheless, it becomes easier. We also have, obviously, in that fact, we have a far greater um, access to, to these substances. We have far greater capacity to get to them. Um, and that is a concern. It's a 10 to 15% um, our folk in this field can actually end up with a chemical or substance-related disorder under dependence um, and often hidden, again, because nobody would necessarily suspect that. Um, alcohol dependence, again, also very commonly available. And we've seen in, in rehabs, the ones that I've worked at, an increasing number of, of medical professionals who've ended up in treatment um, and find it very difficult find it both difficult in terms of the time away from their practice, uh, the fact that they are now also going to have to suffer possible reputational damage. How do I explain this to people in terms of where I was, what I've been going through? How do I, how do I get into a space where I can actually challenge that and, and, and to deal with that? And then having to actually acknowledge within themselves that this is something I've been, I've been trying to cope with and that I haven't let my patients down, that I haven't I carry that enormous sense of guilt and shame, which is the internalized um, response to, to stigma that I, I don't feel that I'm capable anymore. And then I've got to challenge that and find the fact that I'm still human and I'm able to deal with these vulnerabilities. And becoming a patient after having been on the other side of the script pad or the side of the desk for a lengthy period of time is extraordinarily difficult. Um, and it challenges us in, in every possible way. Um, the abuse of opiates and benzodiazepines, obviously in self-prescribing, um, these are things that I'd encourage you. I mean, it's, it's not a perfect thing. It is Hollywood, but again, it's an interesting uh, kind of series just from one perspective. I think it, it, it's it's a series called Dope Sick. Um, read the book. There are other versions of it and everything else. But what is interesting, that what it struck me the, from most is the, the picture by Michael Keaton, the doctor in this, and how we – I watched this with other folk who aren't in the medical field, and their response was very critical of him in this. Bearing in mind, it is dramatized. But their, their response was very, very critical. I watched it and I looked at a man who was trying the very best that he could to cope with an enormous amount of pressure on him, that he is trying to manage the well-being of his patients. He's trying to be responsible, trying to be ethical, and at the same time managing very personal loss and very you know, personal emotional injuries. And it got me thinking about how we don't know how to reach out. Again, we come back to the private practice conundrum is do we have the mechanisms available to us? Do we have a phone that we can pick up? Is there a number we can contact? Is there somebody we can speak to that we were able to share this with our feeling and how we're coping with this before it gets to the point 
where we start to actually decompensate because of the substances that we use or because of the mechanisms that we put in place um, to, to help us manage and cope with that. And that what goes with that is that the damage that we feel emotionally, for example, in writing a script with somebody questioning our ability to have done that in, in the most ethical and the most practical of ways. And we have that fear, and I don't think it's necessarily hidden as much as we think, but there's a, a fear of being reported as impaired. There's the concern that we are going to land up on a list at the Health Professions Council because we're no longer capable of doing our job, that we are now no longer somebody who should be allowed to practice. And we have that risk of something that means that we hide this as much as possible. Um, and we have, funny enough, a compassion for other folk in this profession, but do we provide the necessary help when we feel the only thing we can do then is to report them statutorily? Again, do we have the mechanisms and the networks in place to deal with this? And that's the aim here is that how do we start to challenge that? How do we take this outside of the realm of just conversations between ourselves as colleagues and as professionals? And how do we start to recognize the actual need that we have to get good quality care and treatment for things that we as human beings are suffering from, that we don't have to hide this anymore, that we don't need to keep this hidden, that we don't need to see this as stigmatized, we don't have to see this as shameful, that if we are providing good evidence-based care to our patients, we deserve the same in return. And we deserve the same compassion and quality and attention to care from our colleagues as we do the same as anybody else does. And this is the thing I'd like you to take from tonight's talk. If you ignore everything else, including my rather poor choice of of little photographs that are a bit fuzzy, is just that, is that we have to up the game and up the standard of what we feel need to, we need to give each other. We need to take it out of the, the informal discussion that is very brief and often very, very kind of superficial in the corridors of hospitals or practices, the looks that we kind of shrug our shoulders, we just carry on. We take it out of that realm and we start to put it where it belongs, which is in good quality care pathways, where we acknowledge this, and start to deal with this as seriously as any other condition out there. And in a way that is non-judgment, and in a way that is no longer going to be seen as necessarily leading to censure or being struck from a register or being challenged to discipline, that we start to recognize our basic humanity. Okay. Because one of the things that we suffer here are moral injuries. We struggle and suffer with the fact that we have to make choices every day. <clears throat> I, as a psychologist, far less, far, far less than any of my colleagues here tonight that are in the medical field. I don't get to make those, but I'm acutely aware of the challenges that you folks face. And this moral injury is something, while there's no actual universal decision or definition of what this might be, it comes about through the psychological distress that we have because we feel that we have to compromise our moral or ethical values. We have to make decisions that go against what our fundamental beliefs would be, whether those are, in fact, maybe something from a religious perspective or from a professional perspective, a philosophical perspective, an emotional one. These are things that challenge who we are and what we are. And there are times where that's unavoidable. It's inescapable. And I think that you would have felt that very, very often during COVID itself, that there would have been moments where you would have to make a decision that you might have angsted over later, going, was that the right thing to do? I know it was the right thing in the moment. I could feel this is what needed to be done. But is it something that went against my basic values? Ethically, I had to do this. Did I feel that I needed to do that morally? And what we get from that is guilt, shame, self-doubt, the sense that I am somehow less than. And again, am I able to share that with somebody? Am I able to open up about that and share what I'm going through without getting censured for that? Am I able to do that in a way that lets people see my humanity? And that, in fact, is what makes me a better clinician, is the fact that I'm able to identify these things within myself. I do not need to be quite so clinical about it. Um, I, I get quite upset. I, I, have a, I have a very kind of different sort of interactional style uh, with patients and I get quite irritated when one of them will say to me, it's happened at least once a week, they'll say to me, you know, you're, you're just very clinical, you lack a sense of humor, um, you have no humanity about you. Um, I get quite indignant um, and I, I have to try and manage that response then because I, I would want to scream to them very often, do you understand what it takes to do this job day in, day out? Do you know what it takes to not want to talk about things that are bothering me? I don't get to be that side of you. I don't get to share that with you. I don't get to share how difficult it is coming to work when my daughter is sick or having to go after a talk or do something and go deal with a relative who's being admitted or deal with a personal issue. I don't get to do that. And yet you tell me I am cold, clinical, and impersonal. Now, this is not about me. 
but I would guarantee you that I'm not the only one that has felt that at least once this week. That will will, will challenge you, and yet we don't get to share that. We don't get to share our humanity because then we're seeing it's less than good at this and means that we do. And those are the levels of self-doubt that we carry with ourselves, that we, we walk away from these moments thinking that somehow we haven't done right by our patient. You know, and when we don't address these moral injuries, when we don't address what is actually going on within ourselves, that's when we start to develop a higher risk for depression, anxiety, and burnout, that we have the classic example of work-life imbalance, but that we are not allowed to express who we are to deal with those traumas in a healthy and constructive way and something we have to look at. So the thing for us is, is that it doesn't mean we treat ourselves. It doesn't mean we have to continually treat ourselves and do that in isolation. We don't have to see everything as something I have to prop myself up, that I have to put myself together with plaster, sticky tape, and the odd splint and keep going. And I don't need to share this because we wouldn't suggest that to our patients. We wouldn't do that. We would go that that's contrary very often to, to care. That's very contrary to recovery. It's very contrary to sort of good mental and physical health. And yet we apply this to ourselves. We don't have a skill set that we can address this to ourselves. We're not meant to do that to ourselves along this way. So yeah, does that heal or heal yourself? It does not mean you treat yourself. So what are some of our protective factors? Okay, and so one of the key things is going to be using professional, having access to and using professional counseling or therapy services. And this is often seen as a bit of a soft skill, a bit of a soft area. In many cases, it doesn't seem to carry any value. Um, I will tell you, having worked with a lot of specialists and doctors through the years as patients, um, there is at least two sessions where I have to just spend time just kind of normalizing it, make it feel like there's going to be some value to this. They're not going to be seen as nuts. That They're not just whinging and whining. That in reality, that what they're going through is, is very real. Um, but that there is something, this is valid. This is not something that is an indication that they are somehow falling back on a soft skill and they're not able to cope. So we've got to have access and it's often concerning, I think, for doctors, if you have to go and see a psychologist, and I've had that, I've, I arrange the doctors that I see, I try and arrange that they can come later in the day or very early in the morning so they don't have a risk of bumping into one of their patients in my waiting room because what would happen to them, their reputation, if that were the case? And we try to be sensitive to that because we still want to provide the service and we want to give you good quality care, but we need to be aware of the fact that this still has to be followed. We still need to get you into that kind of treatment space and do it as safely as humanly possible. And from a, from a less from a therapy perspective, but those interpersonally, we want to actually develop and utilize the relationships we have with our fellow professionals. We want to use those as a resource. We want to be able to look at those and go, I don't just want to have a two-minute conversation in a, in, in a corridor somewhere. I want to have a proper chat with you. I want to be able to sit and speak. I want to be able to sit and share what it is I'm going to. There are commonalities here that I need to be able to share with you, things that are not just going to be dealt with in a, in a brief moment where I'm able to profess vulnerability, but also then put on the mask of competence, <clears throat> that in reality, what I'm also doing is giving you permission to share with me and we can start to break down that stigma that it's that we have to be okay all the time. <clears throat> Speaking to friends and family, now, again, we're not asking anyone to break confidentiality and act unethically, <clears throat> but we need to utilize those resources. These are folks that care about us more than anybody else. How are we able to decompress? Are we able to bring these folk into our world and just let them understand where our emotions are we're not necessarily sharing the details of that. I have a <clears throat> patient who is the wife of a specialist uh, surgeon and uh, she is very attuned um, to him and she can tell after many years of marriage when he's had a bad day, when you know, something hasn't gone right in theatre, when this hasn't worked. But she will say to me that I don't he never gets to tell me anything. I have to guess this. I don't need to know. I don't want to know. But it would make such a difference if he was able to just say to him, I had a bad day. My response to the bad day would be in this emotion, that emotion, et cetera, these thought processes. And getting him to do that has been particularly helpful because having done that, he's able to better share with her and decompress more effectively without actually breaking any sort of level of confidentiality. Um, life diversity, as a media, can be, this is just really creating multiple spaces for ourselves to decompress. This is a, it might be as simple as kind of starting a hobby, getting into an activity, but creating diversity around it. Recognize that one size does not fit all. 
that we don't have to rely on one thing all the time because that way is where we often end up, you know, for example, substances can be an issue. My way to decompress is have a few beers, a few glasses of wine. Cool, do that, but do that around other things. Go garden. Do things that put you back in contact with who you are and that are going to be easily accessible to you. So we need to have multiple spaces for that, not just one. Okay. <clears throat> Exercise. Um, I would I would think, I would guess, I'm, I might be alone with this. I don't think I am, but I, I get particularly kind of frustrated when people say to me, patients say to me, yeah, I need to go to gym. I need to go to gym. And my question for them always is, does it have to be gym? I mean, how long have you had a gym membership? Um, and they will often say, no, a couple of years, you know, and I, I haven't gone. I go, well, you're not going to go. Um, but what you do is you talk to yourself by telling yourself that it has to be gym. When in reality, what you're saying is you want to exercise. Exercise has many shapes and forms. Um, so rather than engage with that, find the, the double benefit of maybe going for a hike because you get out into nature, you get around people, but you're nonetheless getting exercise. What you face with not going to gym is how you're failing every single day. Every day that you don't go proves that you're not capable of caring for yourself and looking after yourself. So one of the key things with the protective factor here is understanding the distinction between self-care and self-soothing. And that self-soothing is something that's immediate, it's short-term, and it's quick. It has very limited sort of uh, durability, doesn't last very long as a result, and it tends to end up leave, leaving us feeling more, more guilty and, and less satisfied with that. And self-care takes longer, it requires more planning, it requires a disruption in your day, it requires a shift, and that's exactly why we want it, because it does require you to shake things up. It requires you to restructure what you're doing, recognizing that your current structure doesn't actually work as well as you'd like to think it does. So self-care would be longitudinal things. It would be hobbies. It would be things like exercise, joining hiking clubs. I don't advocate cycling but just because I, I think cycle, cyclists look silly. But that's that's my personal that's my personal hobby horse. Folk out there that are cyclists, you, you're welcome to speak to me after the group. Okay. And then hobbies and activities. Again, you know, we, we need to have things that intellectually stimulate us. I am. Um, I've made a point in my life of making sure that the hobbies and activities I have are intellectually demanding and stimulating because that's where I work on a daily basis. And I like to pursue that in a similar vein, but things are much more sort of, uh, that feed me in a different level. And that's what's worked for me is I find that different pressure cells, I need to find a way to fit these pressure cells together in such a way that I'm able to, to function. That's taken a long time, Peter. It takes a lot of work, a lot of focus. But the challenge is to dedicate that amount of time to doing that because we dedicate an enormous amount of time to getting CPD points. I mean, everyone's here tonight to get the ethics point. We all know how much we love ethics points. Um, and we will do that. We'll dedicate ourselves time to that. How many of you out there are, are giving yourself an hour a week to do something completely different? How many of you are giving yourself an hour to not chase points, to not chase patients, to not do these things, and to not feel guilty about it? To do something that is relatively guilty, but is focused on yourself. And that is something I want you to think about with us. We then, we then get to one of the most difficult things, and especially for folk who are working in, in, in organizations, maybe folk who aren't in private practice, where it's government or private organizations, where we are not necessarily in charge of a whole process from start to finish. What we have is we have a part to play within that, but we're still in structures where there are leaders and there are managers ahead of us and above us. And we are then, to some extent or to a considerable extent, at the mercy of the effectiveness or ineffectiveness of the leadership of the folk in the organization. Do they understand the actual demands from an ethical, care, clinical, and professional perspective that we face on a daily basis? Are they able to, to marry that with the, the demands of the, uh, the organization? Can they, can they see our role within that? Um, it isn't just always about the bottom line. It's about making sure that quality care and professionalism is managed on top of that and that who we are as people is, is heard and taken care of. And that as a result, we need proper employer support. Um, I think one of the ironies of all of this is that, and again, if I'm wrong, please shoot me down, but I have spent a lot of time over the years working with teams and individually and speaking to professionals in various professions where the patient will be referred to an employee assistance program, some sort of employee wellness program by their employer. And I go, wouldn't that be really nice if we could refer ourselves to something like that, where there was something that was given to us in a way that was not judgmental, um, and how easy it would be, because it's quite nice to be able to refer a patient to that and go, great, that organization, that structure will take care of you. And we can rest with some ease when, that, when that's done and we go, that will happen. How often do we not feel that we need that ourselves? And that's one of the drives again tonight is to say, how do we start to utilize those structures that are actually available to us? And I would challenge you with this is to, is to not take this as just another ethics point. 
this is not just that. This is a much more emotional and, and practical appeal to, to harness that. You know, what we did at the end of our discussion, the last one that surprised us and people took it seriously is the symposium was that we opened up the floor to folk who were willing to share what their challenges had been um, at a professional level with colleagues from, from where they were. And, and the folk were sharing things along the lines of, you know, that I remember being told that um, when one psychiatrist registrar I said, psychiatry registrar, I said, I'm being told that by handling this case, my management proved that I was incompetent, that no matter how often I wanted to share what my, my, my plan was, I was told that I was incompetent. And when I tried to raise this, that, that my, my hurt and my concern around being told that, I was told I was too weak, I was too thin-skinned to be able to deal with this. Um, another a general practitioner telling me that he, in fact, you know, he'd been told that his choice of, um, of partner, his choice of wife, um, indicated that he was incompetent as a clinician because how could he choose someone like her to be in his life? Um, what did that say about his judgment? Um, and that when he raised this with, um, with his professor, who was the person who said this to him, that he was told as well that he needed to think, toughen up and deal with this because this is what people were going to look at. And we had a range of stories shared. We had a range of how this worked because the concern, the trauma that doctors carry, the long hours, the enormous emotional load when you lose patients, the training, speaking to a physician, uh, both during and after COVID, asking him how he dealt with the loss of a patient. He said through humor, you know, through to trying to find the fun and the funny part in things um, and how we how we deal with that um, and who we are. I said, yeah, that's great. But what do you do when you leave? When you when you when you leave at the end of the day, how do we how do we cope with this? You can see my ugly face for the first time. Um, how do we cope with with that pressure? How do you go home and deal with that? And he said, I I just compartmentalize it. I push it aside. Um, and I said, what happens one day if, for example, those all combine? to overwhelm you, what are you going to do then? He said to me, then I will deal with it then. By then I will be in my 70s and it won't be my problem anymore. And was struck by how, how sad that was because this was something that he was back then. And you could see that. But could he tell his colleagues that this was a thing? Would it be worthwhile? Would it be valuable to tell his colleagues he's, lost, he's dealing with the loss of a patient that he put an enormous amount of work into? Would that suggest that he was too weak, that he was too emotional? Dealing with families, where if you have to give families bad news and deal with families, you're dealing with grief because a patient has passed away. What will you, what will you do? How do you cope with that? Do you walk away still feeling hurt and indignant? Can you share it with them? It's very often you can't. That is not positioned as your job. So this is the aim of tonight's talk, is to go, how do we start to provoke discussion? How do we start to generate? And it's not about giving you all the tool sites, but starting to provoke a discussion as much as possible. We've seen that groundswell that move towards understanding this. And we hope that tonight is going to challenge them, that we're going to get you to start to look for resources, start to utilize the folk in your environment in your life at the moment effectively. And we start to challenge how we're using the resources away from work um, as, as effectively as we, as we possibly can. And so I want to thank you for taking the time to listen to me. I, I think we're going to have um, somebody else come on now and uh, you'll be able to sort of come back and get rid of my, my droning voice. Uh, thank you so much, Nell. It's a very, it was a very informative and excellent presentation. Most of my thinking and question you clarified but in Q&A, we'll have some question at the end after the second speaker finish. So we'll join and try to answer all the concerns and questions. So it's over to Casey Chambers. Please take over. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and thank you, Neil, for setting the tone and covering such an important topic that is so complex and so many different layers and making it so real and relatable. And I think this is where the challenge comes tonight in continuing this important conversation, which was important before COVID and is important now more than ever as we take these new you know, steps and make sure that we don't lose the momentum. Um, I just wanted to share and wrap up some of those resources that, that you're talking about and kind of where to from here um, and looking at our different spaces. And, and I have the pleasure of also sharing this evening around the Healthcare Workers Care Network. This was an initiative that started in collaboration through different organizations in response during the, the heat of COVID um, in 2020, which seems such a long time ago. And one of the opportunities that came out of COVID when everyone was working online and responding and, and trying to figure out this global pandemic that had hit us, 
we knew that mental health of healthcare workers was important before COVID, but we knew that during COVID, we had to do whatever we can to mobilize support and care for our healthcare workers working on the front line because we had to look after them. We had to look after their, their mental health. We had heard all those slogans, it's a marathon, not a sprint. But at the time, we thought it was the longest marathon ever. And three years later, it's not a sustainable marathon at all. And through the Healthcare Workers Care Initiative and network, where we were really focusing on caring for the carers by the carers, through this collaboration that brought everyone together in this new online world, we came together and pulled our resources to look at how do we provide the support to healthcare workers across the country and anyone working on the front line, whether they were a hospital porter or a clinic receptionist, whoever was working in the healthcare sector, private or government, was able to access these resources and that we were able to meet that demand and ensure that we were providing free mental health support and care and therapy to people who needed it the most in whichever form or platform they needed. You know, during that moment, we were not able to do face-to-face. -face. We had people in rural areas. We were setting up online sessions with psychologists, psychiatrists, registered counselors, and social workers online, after hours, through teletherapy, online sessions, WhatsApp calls, whenever we were able to provide this help to doctors and nurses and healthcare professionals who were working on the coalface when they needed it the most. Through these different initiatives and collaborations, um, we were able to launch the Healthcare Worker Care Network package of support services that includes a 24-hour toll-free helpline, which is free from any landline or cell phone, available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, every single day of the year. We know that our mental health doesn't have working hours, and neither do our South African healthcare workers. So after a long shift at one o'clock in the morning, if someone needed to debrief or just to talk or just to feel less alone, you're able to pick up the phone and speak to a trained counsellor. There's also an SMS line that you can SMS and someone will call you back. And we have an extensive website. It's a bit long, it's a bit of a tongue twister, but we can't make it easy. So it's healthcareworkerscarenetwork.org.za. And on the website, you're able to fill in an online form that can request for help or call back when you're most available. And you can request if you want individual therapy or support or training or debriefing, or maybe even specific COVID safety PPE information specifically from, for you from another healthcare professional. We also have resources such as videos and website guidelines and resources that are available that you can watch and use right now at your fingertips. We've also tried to make sure that this resource is also available on other platforms where we're seeing healthcare workers, such as EM Guidance app or the Vula app, um, even on the SAMA website. I've also included our direct email address because I'm hoping tonight that we have some managers and HODs and team leaders who are part of the call tonight thinking, what can I do to look after our team? What can I do for my clinic, for my hospital, for, for my department? And this is where I'm really encouraging people to reach out through this email address so that we can look at how do we work together? How do we pull all these resources and learn and share together? This is just some insight into the website as to what you can find and what resources are available and that you can use for free and share. We have our training modules online for healthcare managers who are leading teams on how to be more vulnerable and compassionate leadership in spaces where we need it the most. So what help is available? Free telephone counseling and crisis intervention 24 hours a day. We also provide four pro bono individual or group sessions with a mental health professional. And we have an amazing database of volunteers of psychiatrists, psychologists, GPs, social workers, registered counselors from across the country. We provide online sessions or teletherapy or even face-to-face -face sessions. We provide leadership training and coaching. And to date, we've helped train over 5,000 people around the country. And the need and the demand we know is growing. And we're here to say we want to hold hands and do this together. When we look at some of the narrative that we've seen over the last couple of years, we're really trying to create a compassionate narrative that also lets people know that our healthcare workers are people too, and that they also need support. 
And through this is creating awareness through various press and media and really encouraging and reaching more people through trying to create awareness in all these different platforms. When we look at the numbers of the thousands of healthcare professionals that have reached out to the Healthcare, work, care, healthcare Workers Care Network, we have to be very mindful that these numbers and calls and emails are people like you and me who've reached out who are really struggling. And we know that those that have reached out is very encouraging, but that we know that the demand and the need on the ground is so much higher and there's still such a stigma and shame of reaching out. And it's those people and those stories that make us come back and say, we need to do more. We need to reach more people because we know that there is support. And it's having to share that it's okay not to be okay, but that they're not alone and that there is help. Some of these people could be colleagues that we work with, colleagues that we know, it could be us. And I think it's very mindful to, to realize that we have to start and continue these conversations. It can't end now. Um, there was a really important question in the Q&A as to what happens post COVID. Where do our healthcare workers end up? And this is where we really have to pick up that it is important for us to continue these conversations. Ending stigma changes lives. Just by joining this evening, we're able to start conversations. We're learning more. We're finding new language to talk about it. It's becoming top of mind. The real challenge comes in, what do you do with this information from tomorrow? What conversation do you start? Who do you speak to? Is there someone that you know that might be struggling that you can reach out to tonight and say, hey, I'm really worried about you. Are you okay? You might not be comfortable to talk to me, but here are resources. Let's do a coffee soon. I'm thinking of you. How do we take what we're learning tonight and the feelings that we're feeling? And I'm sure a lot of people are, are relating and, and having light bulb moments. And what do we do from here? How do we take that? I think the first step is through advocacy, advocating for the mental health of our healthcare workers to be a priority, advocating to change what is right now into what should be on how we normalize talking about mental health issues, how we normalize talking about getting help or therapy or treatment, and how we normalize encouraging people to talk about their struggles. So what's next? Where to? I think this is where we start sharing, and I know we've got the Q&A and people are sharing, and, and I really do encourage you to take this as we need to learn from each other. Um, there has been such a culture of, I can do this, we're the superheroes, I'm fine. But how do we learn from each other? What has worked? What has maybe worked in your department? What has worked in your team? What is the best practice to help us break the stigma around mental health of healthcare workers? How do we become allies? Where did you find a conversation that really sparked and encouraged someone to get help? And how do we create these safe spaces in the workplaces that we're entering every single day? There might even be some really creative ideas of what you think could work that you've never had the opportunity or possibility to do before. And this is where I'm encouraging you, what is that next right step? Creating those conversations, sharing those resources, promoting the help that is available. Um, the Healthcare Workers Care Network has posters and business cards with these resources available. And I'm encouraging wherever you are in the country to please reach out to us. You can email us on sadagcaresandanxiety.org.za with all of your details. And we can post courier, pigeon mail, this information that you can stick up at your coffee station, at a notice board, at the back of a toilet door, wherever we can share this information is incredibly important to get help and intervention and support before it's too late. Learning more, joining tonight, going to the website, finding out more of how we can create these conversations and create support is what we hope. I'd like to share now, you're welcome to take a screenshot, a picture. We will be sharing the slides and you're welcome to share it with any of your teams. Is that it is, it is okay not to be okay, but you don't have to do it alone, that there is help that there is support. And there is the toll-free helpline, the SMS and the, the website. I know that even in the Q&A, we saw there are some students, some dentist students from different universities and 
just different medical students. And I wanted to just share this resource as well, is that we have the Discovery Medical Students Helpline, which is run by SADAG, which also provides the support. It's a dedicated go-to line for any medical student or young doctor who's needing support and help. Just this evening, we hosting currently right now, an online support group meeting for any and all healthcare workers. The confidential can be anonymous support group, it's online and you can connect and join with other healthcare workers who may be going through similar struggles and just to feel less alone. All the details are available on the website as well. And we encourage you to join normally the last Thursday of every month. And we will be sharing all of these details. I think for anyone who, who has any questions or concerns, we'll be monitoring the Q&A. I just wanted to say thank you for dedicating your time this evening on this important topic. And I challenge you and I urge you to take this information to create one more conversation tomorrow, one more check-in, and it could make the world of difference. Thank you, everyone. Well, thank you so much, Casey. It's a very enlightening. Thank you so much. You are, you are doing a great job. In fact, I'm learning today more than what I knew before. So it's really very important as a health worker what we are teaching us today. So without wasting my uh, more time, uh, Q&A, there are some questions. I think it was answered during your presentation and uh, also by nail presentation. But let's take check first five and combine, we can answer some of them. The very first one was where are health worker going to be at the end of pandemic? I think you touch part of it. So that was one of the first question. I, th I think we, we're seeing that we, we're still coping. You know, I think that the analogy that I would use here is that we, we're kind of building the airplane while we while we're flying it, you know, I think we we're still trying to trying to recover from that. And, and as I said, I think we've got the the hangover, if you would. So I don't think we we're there yet. I think there's this is the point of tonight is we have to highlight the fact that we we are not where we need to be. We're, we're not close to having that sense of stability. We're still very strong. I'd be very vulnerable. Um, and I don't want to go dramatize and say we're the hidden victims here. I don't want to make it sound like dramatic, but there's a hidden aspect of this. And so we're not where we need to be. Um, and, and looking at some of the questions and the comments, I'm very encouraged because it means we're actually getting the, the conversation going. That's the way we start to challenge. How do we get to where we need to be? That's how we get to do it. We have these discussions. We, the fact that just some of the folk who go, gee, you know, this is good, this is much needed, tells me that, that we're not where we need to be at this point. Thank you. The another question: Has there been a difference in the research of burnout between mental health care workers who work in public institution versus those who work in the private sector? I think I'd refer us back to some of the stats. If we look at that, sort of almost two thirds of, of medical professionals that were burnt out. Sort of right in the beginning of COVID. Um, a few things. One is that that was those were both urban and and rural. Professional. So that speaks already of the fact that we're dealing with the folk in government as well as private, probably a lot of them within, within the government sector. Um, certainly we see high levels of burnout in, in government sector, uh, professionals working in emergency medicine and casualty departments, very high level um, because of the weight of what's going on there. I, th I think we see that in, in private as well because there are, there are more market-related forces that come into play there as well. So the high levels of burnout. From a mental health care perspective, again, it comes down to, I think, also resource allocation. If you're looking at mental health care and you're working in an inpatient facility, you're working with, with patients who, by definition, are very ill. This is why they've been admitted. So they require intense work work up and they require longitudinal care and if you in a in a, in a, in a, in a private sort of sector we we clearly have more facilities we have more resources available to us in those facilities and so i think the pressures faced by mental health care professionals in state facilities would be enormous you're having to again uh, probably completely wrong but the analogy i would draw is you, you're trying to pay a thousand rands worth of debt with 10 rand and you're trying to make everything go far. And the thing that has to go the furthest is the profession. Nell, any other question you'd like to take from this Q&A? 
Um, I, I, I don't I don't have so much a question, but I'd like to sort of just comment, and Cassie did as well now. I just want to make a comment on the fact that a lot of those, those questions were related to the to the to the gratitude, I suppose, the relief of this conversation being held. Um, I think that's critical. Um, I think that's job done. If we're getting that kind of conversation with Cassie said, you know, tomorrow I just have one more conversation. It's, it's what I, you know, I'm going to patent this. Nobody can quote this, okay, but my patented thing is the degree or the law of one degree. You don't have to do a 180. You know, that's unrealistic. One degree. Make a one degree change. One degree in terms of one conversation. One more meaningful, how are you? Not the, you know, how are you with the intent of moving on? You know, actually hearing about it. You know, we, we're often afraid, I think, to ask that question in case somebody tells us about their bleeding hemorrhoids. So we don't want to hear that. So we just move on as quickly as we can. One degree. One more meaningful conversation. I think there was a comment made as well. I mean, there was one, do our, do our mental health care professionals trust other professionals who trust the system? No. I'll be honest with you. you know, I find more cynicism amongst mental health care professionals than, than you could possibly imagine. You know, and that's what represents burnout. That was, do we, someone said, do we believe in the product we're selling? I'm not sure we do. And so how do we expect our colleagues to open up to us if we don't buy into it ourselves, if we don't show that basic compassion? It's not a skill that we learn at university. Can we just bring basic compassion? That's what we're asking people to get. We're not, not necessarily asking my colleague to be my therapist. I'm not asking my colleague to be my doctor. I'm asking them to be a colleague, a person. That's what I'm looking for. And so I think we've forgotten that. Um, there was another comment made about personality disorders in management. <laughs> well, that was interesting. I think that probably was a self-contained. I think the answer was in the question. No, thank you so much. Neil, I, I need to get some information. You see, we get uh, internship placement every year, almost 3,000 interns for medical uh, internship. At the end of two years internship, like uh, September, October, most of the interns get anxiety, stress, depression, because they, they are applying for community service for one year. And community service is supposed to place in a rural hospital or clinics or district clinics. And they start applying application with a psychiatric letter uh, clinical psychologist letter, they don't want to go, they don't want to leave the home. What is this phenomena? Right, two years, they're doing very well internship. Five-year medicine, six-year medicine, they have done well. Just at the end of two years of internship, all become psychiatric problem, and it's become a huge problem for us to handle. What do you think? Suggest? Well, I, I think what we're dealing with then is, I mean, then we, we are treating the horses bolted by that. The horse is gone. I think that we are now dealing with something that's been built up over time. I don't think I don't think we're supporting people in training at universities adequately through their training. I think we're expecting them to use their knowledge to to deal with what they're being shown. We're ignoring the fact that you know they're having to, for example, dissect cadavers. That's not an average day. Not for even even for us in Benoni, that is not an average day. So we're asking people to to deal with this, but we're not necessarily providing the support. Again, there's the drive in academia, and I'm not saying it's wrong, but I think we have to challenge it. Is are we building that in from the beginning, so that by the time somebody gets into ComServe, they have a skill set that they can use. The starts at grassroots level. We cannot expect somebody to now adjust to all of the drama and the trauma that goes on. They're isolated. They're now being held responsible. They've got all that all of that that weight upon them. And we are surprised, we're surprised that they're struggling emotionally and psychiatrically. The system no. needs to be, become more sensitized. No, thank you so much, uh, Neil. I think you answer very well all these questions. And we have more than 400, uh, our uh, member in the webinar. And time is, going past now so i like to thank you Neil and Casey for truly informative session as we come to the close of this enlightening webinar i am filled with the sense of gratitude and information inspiration our collective commitment to the understanding and addressing the mental health challenges faced by healthcare professional in is commandable. 
it is a crucial that the discussion and the revel revelation from today's session do not remain do not remain within confined and virtual space instead let us carry those insight into our workplaces by nurturing and culture of our dialogues empathy and understanding we can positively imp impact on this mental health well-being of not only doctors but of all individuals within the healthcare ecosystem i encourage all of us to take away the lesson learned today and translate them into action that will be our success we must continue to support each other engage in conversation and advocate for positive change as we part ways tonight let us remain connected through the shared commitment to mental health advocacy stay well stay resilient and continue to be the choice you wish to see i bid you a good evening thank you